so today we are going to have Dr. Amin Kharaz, who is an assistant professor in the School of Computing and Information Sciences. He recently joined FIU and he is the founder of Secure Systems Lab. So he focuses on building systems to study security problems such as evasive malware attacks, web and browser security, social engineering, and cybercrime. His research has been distinguished with a Best Paper Award at the web conference in 2019. He also serves in the program committee of top security conferences. Welcome, Dr. Farad. Thank you, Hadi. So should I start now or are we ready? Yeah, go ahead and start. I think uh, two o'clock now. If All it's right. okay with okay, Dr. Dr. I mean, yeah. Sure, please go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending the talk. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Okay. So in 2010, I got graduated from Sharif University. And I became a software engineer at that time in a company. But it didn't actually take a lot of time for me to uh, get bored and miss grad school. So I started to teach a course in, on operating, operating system the next summer, summer 2010. And at that time, Stuxnet attack happens, happened. So I wanted to talk about the attack in the class, but it was not a top topic of in classic security problems like trust, denial of service or authentication. It was about malicious code. It was about evasion. It was about fingerprinting. And I didn't have any, I zero knowledge about that domain. And that was the start of my journey to cybersecurity and getting a PhD in that domain. Now, after 10 years, the ecosystem has changed significantly. The attacks are more prevalent. They are more consequential. Attacks on Target, attacks on Ashley Madison, attacks on Sony Picture in 2015, Equifax in 2017, the, the Democratic National Convention in 2016 are just a few examples of uh, those significant problems that we had over the last couple of years. But what these organizations, these uh, companies have in common, they are victims of massive data breaches. So in this computing ecosystem, every company is now a tech company and each tech company can be an attractive target for adversaries. In fact, cyber attacks today are impacting every user every company in every nation. So cybercrime is a multi-million dollar industry and internet is now a battlefield among nations. Today, we don't really get surprised if an APT attack like Stuxnet happen on uh, a nation and a company or an organization. So that being said, in this dynamic ecosystem, what is my vision? How I look at these problems? So my vision is to build tools, build techniques to assess security of software systems and tackle their immediate and significant problems. And in this talk, I will give you two examples of what I mean by that. So scientifically analyzing emerging threats is a non-trivial problem, right? You need tools, you need approach, you need a hammer in order to do that. So my approach to security, to solving security problem is a four step process. Instrument, catalog, analyze, and react. So it starts with instrumentation phase. I add software, a layer of software that is added in order to increase visibility over the behavior of software system, their runtime behavior. Then I catalog the, uh, the, the extracted data 
Security is all about visibility. If we don't see something, we can detect it. We can react, right? Equipped with that lens instrumentation layer, we collect terabytes of data. And in an analyze phase, we are equipped with that terabytes of data, which is our asset, in order to extract invariant characteristics of attacks. What is it that makes an attack successful? Is it predictable? How can we extract those kind of information? Because we have fine grain information about those attacks because we invested a lot of time in the previous steps, we have that data. And the last step is translating what we learned into something that can be applied in practice, in detection, in protection. And this is the process I use over and over again over the last 10 years. And in this talk, I will explain how I incorporate that. Second question, what problems I'm interested in? I am usually interested in problems that are intersection between societal, technical, and economic aspects of cybersecurity. And this is actually some of the already published work and today I'm going to talk about these two papers, one in the area of web security and the other in the area of malware defense, malware uh, protection. So today's talk deals with first, how can we uh, infer underlying aspects of an emerging threat? How to attack, how an unknown threat manifests itself when it's loaded into software systems? And the second step is how can we identify the technical choke points of these threads? What are the invariant characteristics of the attacks? What makes the attacks successful? And third one is how to build, how to automate defense mechanism. How can we translate an abstract concept into quantifiable information that we can use them that for defense purpose. So I start with ransomware attacks and protecting users against ransomware attacks. So ransomware is a, uh, you, might, you might be familiar with the concept. It's an extortion scheme that locks victims' computers and threatens to destruct critical data if the user doesn't pay that may or make the payment. So in 2014, we, these attacks started to emerge more uh, seriously. Why? Because C started to emerge toward technology was used. So that was a, an, a, the combination of these technology provided an attractive framework for attacker to stay anonymous, right? <clears throat> And we started to see serious attacks on organizations, on hospitals, on educational system. And people start to get worried. They start asking questions. What is the difference between these attacks and other kind of attacks? How can we detect them? How can we protect them, a user against these attacks? And the public domain and also the media was uh, kind of, uh, uh, not sure about uh, the, the entire uh, attack and they, they thought that we are dealing with a kind of attack that is impossible or very hard to defend or detect. That makes the, the entire uh, problem landscape more interesting to me. And because I was working on malicious code, I was interested to see how these attacks work and whether it's uh, interesting from secure, from a uh, research perspective. So similar to other sort of attacks, ransomware is also equipped with common evasive techniques. They want to be, uh, they, they want to stay anonymous. They want, the attacker wants to target right, uh, right or uh, good, places to attack like uh, user machines or for instance, uh, uh, servers of a company, com company. So fingerprinting is always a part of that uh, 
operation, right? So I looked at those samples, some of the samples, and found that yes, similar to other form of attacks, they use dropper, they uh, after fingerprinting the environment, they connect to a remote server, they download the malicious payload, and they start encrypting user data. So the attacker goal was to make user content inaccessible and force victim to pay, right? Now, the hypothesis was that this trait can be monitored if we accurately record file system activity. But the question is, was how we should collect file system activity to be robust against evasive attacks, right? That was the big problem at that time. So back to my approach, instrumenting file system, instrumenting developing a kernel module that sits in the kernel in a high privilege mode and make the evasion difficult. So we developed Onveil that was attached to the file system and started recording the interaction of user mode processes with the file system in terms of in IO requests with the assumption that most of the ransomware attacks are happening in the user mode, and because they are in the user mode, they can't evade kernel or high privilege mode software that is trying to monitor the operations. Now, we, after running experiment and making sure the system works well in practice in terms of comp being completeness, in, in terms of being uh, robust enough, we go, we went to the second stage, which was cataloging the uh, traces and co actually collecting traces and cataloging them. So we used 15 ransomware families, which were around 2,200 samples from, uh, as I said, 15 uh, malware families, uh, ransomware families. We ran them in the in analysis environment that was equipped with our whale, with our module, and we started collecting traces, traces that was kind of logs, low-level logs about the interaction of user mode processes with the file system and, and operating system in Europe. Now, we had a working solution. We had IO traces, the way that malware were interacting with the software, now we need to extract invariant characteristics. What are the, the pattern of these attacks if they want to be successful? So we, we look at some samples and we, uh, our, our hypothesis, as if you recall, was that this operation manifests itself as a set of pattern because attacker wants to uh, encrypt user data as soon as possible. So they might do it aggressively or they might add in intentional delay or artificial delay between the operation. But at the end of the day, there is a mechanism that, we, uh, that shows a repetitive pattern. And that was correct based on what we were collected, what, what we were collecting, it actually showed that at the level of IO, we were still being able to see who was the process that is trying to uh, modify the data with write privilege, for instance. And we also, because we also were collecting the entropy of the buffer payload, so we were also being able to say something about in encrypting the low level, uh, low entropy data with high entropy data, right? These kind of heuristics. And because it was just one or two ransomware families, so crypto, uh, crypto locker was one of the more popular ransomware attack that happened though, while I was working on the, on the project. And we wanted to see whether this approach is generalizable. So we applied some other ransomware families and with some uh, variation, we still saw very similar scenarios. So 
the takeaway of that analysis was that regardless of the family name, regardless of how the code is loaded, regardless of how the crypto system is uh, used in those uh, malware uh, families, they, they, the low level file system activities are predictable. And if you have a module that can re record them, it is highly possible that you can detect a large number of those attacks. Now we have the data, we have the label data, we have catalog them, we have attack modeling. So I'm not going to talk about detail what they were because of time, but they just give you an idea of what uh, the entire uh, uh, experiment would actually look like. So we, because we saw that it works in practice, we ran the experiment for 27 months. We were uh, running, running samples uh, on a daily basis, 2.45 million samples from different places with our industry partner, or Anubis, or uh, some public repositories. And we created a catalog of 140,000 ransomware samples in 25 families. That we built a catalog of active ransomware attacks at that time, which actually community appreciate a lot. So uh, the output, th that, uh, that asset, that uh, catalog was used directly in more than 50 papers over the last couple of years. It also helped us to develop two, two uh, solutions. One was Redemption, which was an in-house solution, and it's now an actively used by an anti-malware company. And Anvil, which was our detection tool, which was used to generate those logs. Any questions so far? Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Ahmet Tarush. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at CSL, FIU. Yeah. Uh, when you were working on Unveil and Redemption, uh, did you realize any legitimate applications that are causing false, false results, ransomware-like behavior? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, there was uh, uh, some benign, look, uh, benign applications that also do low entropy to high entropy uh, operations. But uh, for instance, in the, in, in the detection part, no user was involved in those operations, right? Because in Unveil, we assume that users are not, uh, is not involved in this operation. So if uh, we run a sample and the sample is start encrypting user data, that's most probably that was not a benign uh, operation. That, that, that the, 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 the malicious, the, the payload is, was designed to attack user data. And, th and, th and the threat model was totally different in the redemption, which was a protection tool. We also uh, um, incorporated some, some, some methods in order to uh, reduce the false positive cases, which uh, we, we can refer to the paper or we can talk offline about that. But back to your question, yes, there were benign applications that also were uh, doing this kind of operations, but we were able to find some traits in order to differentiate between those two. Thank you. Hello, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, my name is Harun. I am a computer engineering master's student. Uh, my question is that uh, no, nowadays we see in the white that uh, targeted ransomware attacks increased against the uh, big business organization. From a technical point of perspective, these like IO low level features still keep same, like the attackers change their tactics regarding the retry access uh, operation, or is it, it is still same? So uh, again, a uh, very good question. So today the attack is, beca be is becoming more evasive in terms of not aggressively attacking the user data, but for instance, adding, be, being dormant on the system for a long time or adding in, uh, artificial delay between two consecutive requests. But still, again, because the attacker or the malicious code requires 
modifying the content on the file of the file of the user data, it is still possible to uh, to to report them as anomalous anom uh, anomalous behavior, right? If you if you if you, if you take a look at a large number of uh, benign applications and train a model, it is still possible to identify anomalous behavior in that regard. So we, so this is actually an interesting area. We are also working on that area as well to work more on the next kind, next generation or more evasive uh, ransomware attacks that try to be successful at one hand, but at the same time, they want to stay out of radar. Thank you, Professor. Sure. So I will shift the gear and talk about a totally different problem in browser cryptojacking. So in 2017, if you recall, the price of cryptocurrency started to increase dramatically, right? It was around $2. Everyone wanted to invest on cryptocurrency, including myself. I spent $500 on that and then lost, uh, every penny of that. So adversaries are opportunistic. So, and, but the problem with uh, the, this uh, new um, monetization method was that Bitcoin mining algorithm was super expensive. They required A6 dedicated special hardware, which was not easy for adversaries to acquire. What was the other option? The other option was Monero, which was a lower overhead uh, cryptocurrency machine uh, model uh, that adversaries were able to in, uh, run it on end user machines as well. That was a great news for adversaries, right? Because the, the algorithm, which was called Kryptonite mining algorithm was uh, could be used on end user machine using the uh, typical uh, hardware like a flagship hard a flagship Mac device, Ubuntu server, client, everything. So uh, I, I I wanted to look at what how the this landscape looked like. So I went ahead and tried to see how the adversaries can register for this service and what the entire process is. So people go, go ahead and register to a mining service and the mining services are like the brain of the operation, right? So they assign the mining task, they um, calculate the monetization uh, or revenue of uh, the agents and they are in constant communication with uh, the client in order to uh, define new jobs and so forth. So uh, the, the attacker goes and registers to the mining service and uh, he or she is receiving a URL that has a key with it. And the only thing that the attacker needs to do is to insert this JavaScript tag under the in in the Java, in the HTML source code that is under uh, his control. And this is the panel of one of those mining services. So if, if, as you can take a look here, if you have more user, you will get more money. So it's computed as a, a function of hash rate. So the higher hash rate, the higher monetization gain, right? Now, the question is how adversaries could maximize profitability or their profit. So there are multiple ways to do that. The first one is maximizing the hash rate and the second one is running it on many, as many machines as possible. So adversaries job is to distribute that JavaScript tag, their JavaScript tag across the machine, across the, sorry, across the website that is under their control. And redirecting users to those websites and start 
crypto mining on the background, and crypto mining process in the background. Just to give you an example of how that looks like, I will give you a real world example. For instance, someone is trying to watch a free version of Game of Thrones the last season, right? So he will be redirected to this website. And after clicking watch now, a JavaScript code is downloaded, executed, and it connects to, to the mining service, receive the mining job, and the user will see a higher CPU utilization on his or her machine without actually giving a consent for that. In fact, <clears throat> while the user is watching the videos, they actually have a higher CPU utilizations, but uh, some, some users that are non-sophisticated, they may not correlate this problem of cryptojacking with uh, the website they are visiting. So they, they might say that, hey, this is a high, low streaming website. That's why my CPU utilization is high. So in, in, early, in late 2017 and early 2018, uh, there were several different uh, reports on cryptojacking. Hey, this is the next version of ransomware, or um, <clears throat> th this is actually the new way to monetize the operation without providing any scientific evidence of why this is the case. The, basically, there was no uh, global view of the entire ecosystem and also uh, the, all the claims were, most of the claims were without uh, backup actually evidence. So uh, that was interesting idea for me to, an interesting uh, ecosystem for me to, to uh, look at. So I started looking at the problem by uh, studying the contemporary defense mechanism against these kind of attacks. So like everyone else, the first thing that comes to your mind is that, yes, monitoring CPU utilization might be an indication of uh, cryptojacking. But uh, the issue was that if you wanted to do this at millions of, at the at larger scale, mil millions of websites, most probably you will get a lot of false positive because Using CPU utilization as a, as a sole feature is uh, super uh, noisy for several reasons, right? So, and, and plus the fact that if you take a look at the libraries that were using uh, CryptoJack, that were CryptoJacking libraries, you will see that they could set different thresholds for those operations in order to bypass common. Uh, threshold-based detection methods. So that was not a viable approach. So I also take a look, took a look at some uh, extensions that were designed for this purpose. They which were basically using some blacklist uh, rules in order to bypass, in order to detect uh, those resources on the websites. But there is uh, no lack of evidence that back, blacklist rules can be evaded easily using obfuscation, coding, coding, uh, uh, basics of filing coding and other kind of custom encoding mechanism. So I thought that this is actually an interesting area to look at. So back to my approach, I started instrumenting the browser. I wanted to see what is loaded into the browser, how it's loaded, and what is the runtime behavior of those JavaScript libraries. So I instrumented Chromium in the binding interface where basically every code that wanted to access the browser resources had to pass that bridge. It's, it was like a bridge that everyone has to pass that in order to access to camera, access to CPU, access to GPU, access to anything, right? So we, we created an, uh, an instrumentation layer that uh, logs about 
and 9,000 JavaScript function of the browser. So basically like operating system, any code that was dynamically loaded could be monitored with this approach. At least a large part of their functionality could be recorded. And when we did that and run, ran some of these um, JavaScript libraries, I got amazed. As a person that was working on malicious code for a couple of years, I was amazed with the system scale of those people. So something that I found out was that they were the early adopter of new technologies. So WebAssembly is, is, a, is a new technology. WebSocket is relatively new technology. Incorporating these two together, distributed task scheduling using mining pools, right? Parallel processing using web workers, including incorporating all these features together and designing a working solution was a very was a super interesting project, system project, and I was uh, I got surprised and I got more interested in working uh, on this ecosystem and I'm understanding what the components are. Back to my approach. Now I have instrumentation layer. Now I want to collect corresponding traces right, in order to have visibility over the operation of loaded code. So I collected JavaScript libraries from 12 different cryptojacking families and ran inside the browser, instrumented browser, and collected the corresponding traces, right? Now the time, and now is uh, actually the time that we wanted to see what we can get from those traces. What are the invariant characteristics of the attack? How the attack becomes successful? And how we can use those traits in order to develop a model, develop a technique to automatically detect them. So one of the first thing was that cryptojacking was depending on parallel processing, right? Once the user is visiting the uh, cryptojacking website, they want to maximize profitability. They want, that's why they need parallel processing. Otherwise, their hash rate becomes uh, lower, right? So that's why they need web workers. And each web worker will pass, will pass a, a web assembly module that was actually uh, trying to um, solve those um, cryptographic challenges. So for, for those that doesn't know what web worker is, web worker is like a duplicated copy of your tab, but in a background mode. So you don't see it, but it's just a copy of that uh, browser. It's a kind of headless uh, browser. So each one has a copy of that web assembly code. So the, high, the larger number of web workers, the higher parallel processing, and higher parallel processing is higher hash rate, and higher hash rate means higher monetary gain. Another invariant was po uh, impact on the post messaging, calling specific function in order to interact between web worker and the main process. So each web worker, wanted to give updates about the result of the mining task that uh, it was assigned to. So the interaction between these two was based on post messaging. So uh, we observed that when crypto, crypto jacking operation happens, we, we start to see a large number of requests to post message API, which was not correct which was not actually the case for benign website or even the websites with a large number of third party JavaScript libraries. And the other invariant, just I want to give you three environment. There are some other ones that I don't want to share here because of time, but I would like to tell you this one. 
as well. So um, each web worker had to um, do, had to perform the the mining operation, and this mining operations are uh, scheduled based on the an event loop and event queue, like any operating system that we actually know. So uh, we observe that because it is the, these operations are very process intensive, the pressure on event loop is significantly high. So if we can query the load of event loop as a, as a measure every time, every five seconds, every two seconds, it is possible to actually have it as a feature in our detection method as well. And uh, this is actually the, the same thing that I described here. So I, we, we use around 10 features, but I just talk about three of them here to just give you an idea. Now we have traces. We know the tag model. model. We know how the attack might be, uh, be successful. So we train a machine learning model, we use different uh, um, learning algorithms and we're using a balanced data set and imbalanced data set. We observe that uh, random forest, sorry, SVM was performing better in this case. So we use that for our large scale analysis. So we did the test on our uh, label data set. Now we use it uh, in the wild and see what we can find, right? Because the goal of this uh, project was to first shed light into the underlying ecosystem and how the, the, that system look like, what kind of questions we can answer in terms of monetization, in terms of uh, uh, campaigns, in terms of the parties involved. So we, are, we were able to identify uh, 3,600 cryptojacking uh, libraries that were not seen in our training phase, which actually suggests that we were able to, relative, to model the behavior relatively good. It looks like that we were able, the, the, the tool was uh, working well in practice. So we had some overlap with uh, contemporary defense mechanism but uh, they were able to just detect around 60% of the uh, <clears throat> cases that we, we actually detected. So now we, we have the data set. We had the opportunity to answer some questions that other were not able to. For instance, one of the more important questions was that uh, these mining services that I said were brain of these operations, uh, we're charging 10% to 30% of the mining reward as the mining pool fee. Because they were scheduling the entire task, they were charging between 10 to 15 to 30%. So for and cost, if cost, um, mm, For, for, an, for an attacker, this cost is high. So uh, they basically do something else. They go and find the open source version of this mining pool from GitHub, download it, and set up their own mining pool, or they exploit servers. They push the code on the exploited server, server that they are under their control. We wanted to see whether we can identify those cases. And we were, and the OutGuard, the tool that we developed, was able to identify 24 previously unseen mining services, which were actually using uh, open source um, mining services, mining service services code, but uh, they were not actually reported by any uh, antivirus company at that time. So we were uh, also identify 190. Uh, around two, two, 20 hundred uh, crypto jacking websites that were sharing the same key. If you recall, at the earlier stages of this talk, I was talking about a dedicated key that were assigned 
to the mining agents, right? And we were able to find 35 keys that uh, was distributed across these 20, 20 hundred uh, crypto jacking websites. We were actually suggesting that they were um, controlled by the same uh, entities. Of course, we were using other signals to verify that based on DNS and infrastructure, uh, like accessing to ZMAP. Uh, but this is actually what the, one of the, the conservative uh, uh, result that we had. So there were some other possible cluster that we actually removed in this. We also did some monetization and strat, uh, calculation, and we found that uh, top 200 crypto jacking websites were ma making around $44,000 in June, which was not actually that much. It was not as much as what people were suggesting in media, right? And we had empirical data to show that. It was a global state, it was a large scale analysis. We had access to terabytes of data, but we were not able to find that, uh, I mean, the, the, the numbers that we, people were claiming. So I mean, can I ask one question? It's kind of related to what you just said. Uh, so this uh, crypto jacking websites, so these are kind of small things uh, or are there any big websites that were like hacked and the, the crypto jacking uh, software was installed? Uh, are, are there any like, knowledge about this? Yeah, great, great question. So there were uh, some of these uh, websites with 200 crypto jacking, what, uh, sorry. Some of the, the biggest one that actually make more than uh, five, six thousand dollars per month. Uh, we contacted them and they were not aware of the problem. And those websites were streaming companies. So I maybe it's not time to to disclose their names, but they were some uh, streaming companies and also some webs. There were also some other websites that has free version of uh, of videos. Like uh, as as you can expect, there. The websites that people are expected to, to spend more than one, two, three minutes. Which are those websites? News websites, uh, streaming websites, right? And we saw that in the streaming websites a lot. And also we contacted some of those uh, websites and um, around 30% of them were not uh, aware of that situation. So can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm curious about the tests in the wild. I mean, of course, you verified, you tried to verify your results with Adblock and some uh, extensions, browser extensions. But how about the ones that your model or your test is probably missing? I mean, I, I know it is almost impossible to know how many it is missing. And in terms of the ones you actually can find, you can't manually check thousands of uh, websites that your model said, oh, there is a crypto jacking malware, right? I mean, how, how do you address this charge? This is a very challenging. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we cannot claim anything about false negative cases. Uh, but what we can talk about is false positive cases. So we had false, so I, I don't have any, any, any concrete answer for your question because we didn't, it, it was a large scale, it was not possible to do, to do false negative cases. But in terms of false positive, I, can, I have some answer for you. For instance, we had some parking web, park websites, park domains that were loading several different uh, advertisers or, or third parties that were looking, uh, that were using uh, post messaging and uh, some other feature practicing, ex sorry, exercising some of the uh, more uh, important features in our detection for other purposes. So uh, park domains were one of them. But in terms of false negative cases, I, we had a, a very small manual analysis on that, but uh, on, on label data actually, 
but we really can't say anything about uh, real world deployment in terms of false negatives. So uh, something that I haven't mentioned here, we did another experiment two months later and we found that just 20 websites were using cryptojacking. And one of the reason was that uh, the, the price of cryptojacking, uh, pr cr uh, price of cryptocurrency is, uh, dropped dramatically over two months and monetization is actually a big factor for those adversaries. The, pr the operation becomes less attractive for them, so they, they went ahead and adapted their strategy to do something else. Moving forward. So, as I said, crypto jacking, the result, our results show that the money that these folks were making were not as much as that was reported. So, the entire ecosystem was interesting from technical perspective, but not from uh, economic perspective. But moving forward, I still see some interesting direction in that uh, vein. And I would like to share that with you. So write once and run everywhere has been always our dream as a uh, security people, as computer scientists in general. That's 101, lesson 101 in any computer science program. It's also adversary's goal uh, in this ecosystem as well. In fact, the combination of web worker, web assembly, and JavaScript is designed to add portability, mo mo mobility at the level of web, at the level of browser. But it's also a ticking bomb for adversaries. So adversaries can develop code in C, in Rust, compile it into WebAssembly code and target any machine in, in with any uh, operating system and architecture from Android to Mac OS to, to Unix to, uh, to Ubuntu or any operating system that you can imagine. As long as a web browser is running on those machines. So it's a potential, uh, it, 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 it dramatically decreases the cost of developing malicious code. And this actually becomes more concerning if we talk about the entire ecosystem. So today, industry demands high performance architecture to do everything at the browser level, like they want the same experience, native the experience that native application gives to user in the browser. So they want to change this uh, architecture that you see here. So they want WebAssembly to directly access Web API on the right part. Why? Because it actually adds uh, decreases the overhead and increases the performance. This means that WebAssembly can access to your camera, to your GPU, to your CPU directly. And this is actually becomes concerning because we don't know what the consequences are. And there is no research on the, the requirements or the potential uh, uh, abuses that uh, attackers might actually, uh, we want, might see over the next couple of years. In fact, when a, a useful technology is introduced, it is adapted very quickly, right? This reminds me USB devices. In 2005, every electronic device wanted to be USB compatible. But the first serious security paper about USB was published in 2009 and 2010. And this is going to be a very similar scenario that we have seen in other, in this technology. And we have no lack of evidence that things become popularly, popularly, popular and become widely reused without considering the security consequences of those operations. 
So today I talk about two examples of my work. I talked about how I approach security problem and I give you uh, some details of what I mean by empirical system security how, and how to translate an uh, abstract concept into quantifiable information so we can reason about things. What ransomware means as an abstract, nothing. We need to have data. What cryptojacking means as an abstract, nothing. We need to have data to, 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 to understand what the internal insight of those operations are. And as a computer scientist, I'm a lazy person. This process, I, I've done this process in several papers, but I am tired of doing the things manually. I want to automate things. One of the tasks that I would like to do over the next couple of years is to incorporate advances in machine learning, deep learning, and data science, and make cataloging, analyze, and react more efficient using unsupervised learning. For instance, help a lot in uh, this ecosystem. That's why in, in this pipeline. That's actually one of my priority prop. Uh, uh, one of the, the, the tasks I would like to do over the next couple of years. And in terms of uh, problem selection, I, today I know what I'm working on. I know I'm browser, I work on malicious code, I work on security analytics, but who knows what happens in next 10 years, next 20 years. But I know what kind of problems I'm interested in. I'm interested in societal, technical, and economic aspects of cyber security. Last but not least, I recently uh, established a SIG lab at Florida International University, our university. So our sister labs are distributed in US and Europe. We are uh, <clears throat> closely related. Uh, we, join, we write joint grants, we exchange students, we do collaborative work. So if you are interested in cybersecurity, system security, and you have a strong background in computer science, I would like to chat with you. So you can find more detail at my website. Please feel free to send an email. I would be happy to chat with you. Thank you so much. Any questions? So I have a one question uh, about the ransomware stuff. Uh, yes. So the uh, ransomware that you talked about were user level, but uh, at least I heard that uh, nowadays with the kind of full disk encryption, uh, implementing uh, something like ransomware is actually quite simple because you only need to hijack that uh, master key and encrypt it and uh, everything is instantly uh, ransomware. Uh, are there any Kind of ransomware in the wild that doing this? Are there ways to kind of mitigate this problem? Uh, I think I didn't get your question uh, exactly. So your your uh, no, let me give an example. So for example, on iPhone, uh, basically everything is encrypted, and there is some key somewhere in the memory that uh, decrypts for your purpose. And if yeah. you somehow ransomware can scramble that uh, everything will be lost. Similar on the kind of with full disk encryption system on the Mac or Linux, uh, there's also one key that uh, can just, if you lose or ransomware steals it, uh, something bad is gonna happen. <laughs> and very quickly without using any kind of processing power. Yeah, so uh, it, it, definitely if you're talking about it, it, it so for this, for this, answer this question requires to have a better idea of uh, what the uh, threat model looks like. So definitely a ransomware is not a big problem right now for any system that has a reliable backup solution. I'm not even talking about the keys that they need to hijack, right? So, but the issue with, that we have seen so far more specifically on um, on, uh, on, on, on legacy Windows operating systems or uh, some of the uh, server side uh, operating system that it, 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 it's, it's not still that difficult for them to, uh, 
to just inject malicious code inside the context of benign process and then start in, encrypting uh, the, the operation. So I, I agree with you with the hardware support for, for ransomware protection, but I think there is still areas that is, has actually wide uh, attack surface. I have a question. Uh, we, uh, Arun? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we know that the cryptographic ransomware families are more threatened for the personal computers, but however, in the future, for the IoT de devices, luck lacquer variants could be more threatened. So what do you think about that? So lacquer, so what was the last part of your question? Like uh, what I mean is in the future, maybe when ransomware started to attack the IoT devices, personal IoT or the cyber physical systems, they, they uh, like opposite of encryption, they they are going to try to lock the device. So what do you think about it? How does uh, someone approach that problem? So that's, that, that's actually uh, uh, in terms of attack, of course, I think it's uh, it's a reasonable approach for the adversaries to change the the I mean to, to lock the, the, the device rather than um, encrypting the device. So I think by writing uh, uh, 15 lines of codes, you were able to do that. But in terms of defense mechanism, it's uh, I think it's it's require uh, more in depth analysis on I in to, 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 to detect or defend against that. Like uh, defensive depth is a part of solution. I mean, uh, just because, because we don't have uh, that much power, that much uh, capability at the device itself. And we want the, the solution to be product agnostic. Things should be done outside the IoT devices. And I think defense in depth, anomaly detection and those part of kind of uh, uh, solutions might be more viable in this ecosystem, in, especially in the enterprise level. Any other questions? All right, so if there is no more questions, I would like to thank again to Dr. Amin Haraz for this interesting talk. Uh, he provided his contact information, so if you're interested in his research, feel free to send him an email. Thank you, Amin. Thank you, Hadi, for, for hosting this. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.